So we're going to be talking about dramaturgy today, dramaturgy across platforms and disciplines. We've seen so much multidisciplinary work in the last few days and we'll continue to. And before I introduce this illustrious panel, I just want to bring up a few things that stayed with me that I think will help contextualize this discussion. By the way, I'm Kirk Carlo. Um, so some things that stayed with me that um, made me keep re-questioning what I think of as drama, as theater, as dramaturgy, with dramaturgy meaning literally the making of drama. Um, Basil Twist saying he's interested in creating an experience rather than telling a story. Marlene Schulten creating an immersive multi-year experience for both her performers and her audience. Mariano Pinsotti blurring the line between fiction and reality, audience and Former Claudio Valdez Puri proposing that isn't it time for artists to propose change, giving creative proposals for changing the panorama of our daily lives, wanting art to be useful. And in the performances themselves that I've seen so far, unfortunately, I've seen, I haven't seen both of yours, but I'm seeing them later tonight. Uh, I was struck by a few things that also pertain to this topic of conversation. I don't know how many of you saw El Gallo yesterday afternoon. Uh, but knowing that the dramaturgy of the piece is inexorably linked to the impulses of each of the performers and also to the instincts of the composer, Paul Barker. And last night, watching Stones in Her Mouth, I couldn't help but think that in addition to the, the astonishing performers, uh, Lemmy's lighting designer, uh, Helen Todd, was in my mind a major driving dramaturg in this beautiful piece. And in fact, I rushed down after the last discussion to invite her to be on this panel, but she had to go to another, another talk, unfortunately. Um, so it's clear that ways of making drama or dramaturgy are expanding in incredibly imaginative and collaborative ways. And yet also I want to bring up something, I have a nagging suspicion that if any of us were to go out on the streets upstairs and ask the average passerby, hey, what do you think is, is drama? Most people would say, it, well, it's a story and it's about characters. And so I think one of the things we'll also talk about is I think the disconnect between what an audience expects theater to be and what we theater makers bring to our audiences. And a lot of what we dramaturgs do is act as kind of a, a proxy for the audience during the creation of the play. So to help me wrestle with this question and Others, I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, to my right is Tina Cronus, uh, and this is uh, to Tobias, pronounce your last name? Tobias Kokomans. Kokomans, yes. Wunderbaum, and Jose Luis Valenzuela uh, with Tina Theater Company. We're in his house, so thank you for having us in this house. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think to start, uh, we should, I, are there any drama, self-described dramaturgs in the audience other than Tina Cronus? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> you will know that when you, when somebody asks you what you do for a living and you say you're a dramaturg, it's nobody knows what the whole thing is. And it's nobody understands. Um, so it is still a, a misunderstood a term and people have a very different idea about what it is. So I was wondering if, could describe in your approach to your work and all the work that you do is all very different and you also just told me you work in opera as well as theater. Uh, if you could talk about how you approach the dramaturgy of the work that you do and even if the term dramaturgy is at all important or relevant to you in the making of your work. <laughs> and then uh, taking those pieces and going off in different directions and then coming together and just writing a text and then us coming back. And we do a lot, a lot of work for a month, sometimes a year or more uh, before we ever see actors or any of that. So we, um, we don't say we're having a dramaturgical meeting, but I guess that's what we're doing a lot of times, that sort of thing. And, and we do do an awful lot of research. The 
sometimes goes by the wayside, and then sometimes resurfaces again in another project. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, when we're doing uh, multitasking in, in the work because there's a lot of music in the work, there's also dance in the work, uh, and there's a highly physical style that we've been developing for the past 17 years that we've been working together, we have a, a bit of a shorthand of speaking with each other about creating the work. But uh, nonetheless, all of that goes into. So the shorthand of the physical language is as important as the text? Uh, well, I'd, I'd say that the, the physical language and the text have uh, equal footing in the production, but I always, I like having the text as the, the leading off the text always for us. Even though when we started working together, uh, we did silent work, so there was no text, but there, we did have the text and some. My Hofsky poetry that we were working with at the time, and and then that would uh, sort of incite movement, incite ideas and themes that we would go into, and then we but we never spoke to them um, because I come from a mind background and a dance background as well as a theater background uh, and a clown background. There, got it all, and um, <laughs> it's a lot. So, uh, it, uh, and so I like to approach these things physically rather than verbally at first, although. And I had a great fascination with words when I started working with Richard because I'd never really been speaking them on stage for a long, long time. I'd been silent on stage. And so uh, getting back to working with words, I took each word as this really important thing. And it became, you know, like as, as interesting as a, as a clown can get about, you know, finding a, an object. You know, it's like, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> You know, like, what is it? How does it work? And so for me, it was like discovering a new language, even though we were using English. For me, it was each word became very important. And then we kind of branched out from there and started to create work that uh, didn't uh, necessarily have a narrative, but it were these bits that we would work and create. And then we, by putting them together, juxtaposing different scenes and things like that, we started to look for a story. So we didn't have a story to begin with. So we were looking for a story. You mean in yeah. the course in the course of theater movement bizarre's growth, yeah. story became more important. Now it has. Now now we are even starting with a story and then letting that liberate us to do whatever. Before I think we were working in more of a Dada kind of. So why way. why the shift? You know, I get, we kind of uh, went around the spiral and we're coming around like this, and I think I'm even coming where I'd like to try to drop the words again, but still have them in there in the in the planning and in the research, and then see if we can take away some of this. Also, thinking of uh, reaching a wider audience too is, is part of that. Uh, sometimes working silently, you can reach wider audiences too. So that's that's part of the plot. It certainly makes touring easier internationally. Yeah, that's, that's true. It does. I mean, we saw that with El Cairo, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's a made-up language you can tour anywhere in the world. Uh, what about you? How do you approach dramaturgy in the different fields in which of the different uh, performance parts that you do? That's obviously a very good question. and It's also not very easy to answer, but um, I remember trying to explain my grandmother what my job is. <laughs> and this is a couple of years ago, and it's not really true anymore, but it's a nice anecdote. So I came up with this uh, metaphor that uh, if a performance, if a piece is a ship on the ocean, and the port where you, the destination is the premium, the show itself, and the port where you leave is the finished idea, and if the maker or the director or the actors are the captain of the ship. Then the dramaturge is the navigator. You know, he's having the charts. And if there's a storm on sea, you know, the captain knocks on the door of the navigator and says, let's plot another course. And I mean, it's a very easy anecdote. And uh, when you dive into deeper into it, not into the ocean, but into the <laughs> Then, then you see that, that uh, what a dramaturge does really depends uh, not only on the discipline or the, the, the method, but also on the people you work with 
And then even if you work with them over a longer period of time, even then what a dramaturge is, is changing all the time. So I guess you all work in the theater and you know that the same constellation of people but different productions never get the same result. It's always the so in the end, I think that dramaturgy is, uh, I would summarize it as a involved distance. And I, I mean, as a dramaturge, right? Dramaturgy is indeed, as you say, the making of theater. Everybody in this sense is a dramaturge who is involved in making theater. So what is the, dr the dramaturge, the guy who has this job title, bringing to the fore? And I think it's an involved distance that you are there every step of the line and try to see where the niches or the loopholes are or what is needed at this point without the uh, nerves that a director has or the nerves that a performer has. So the dramaturge can, can create a distance and it's very important to have this distance to, to get the conversation going, or to change the conversation, or to perhaps point out uh, where the conversation has to be about at that point. Um, so basically, you know, in general, I think that dr dramaturgy is really about timing. You can say any, you, know, you can have a good idea, but it really depends on when you say it. <laughs> So, yeah, I would summarize it. And Jose Luis, uh, dramaturgy for you. We're about to work together. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be felt very fascinating because we've been together for almost 30 years. The same group, but your wife, girls, and my wife, Eva, is she here? Yeah. There's Angelina Fernandez in the back. Who, who was the writer in the company. And we evolved from not having a writer individual writer to now she is the best writer the company and it's funny we never talk about dramaturgy meaning we never say we are dramaturgy but it takes around maybe two years sometimes three years to create a play for us you know from the idea uh, and, and, and a lot a lot that she she kind of makes up the story and what the story is going to be and we have a, a process of image creating it's so important for us that the actors propose the image for the scene for a specific moment. You know, so we work in that way and because a lot of times a moment after a first draft, basically. Sometimes or? after a first draft we get the idea of documents. Depends what the scene like so it depends on the idea, like uh, <coughs> There's so many, the process are different in every, every process. And there, there are ones who like doing adaptation of the, the Labyrinth of Solitude, which is an essay, really. You know, how do you write, talk about what we think that book is about, you know, without the actor. So when she shows the chapters that she wanted to work on, and then as a company, we began the process of. So your entire cast, the entire cast, cast right. begin to dramaturg, and then she goes home and she writes and brings it back, and then we put it on the street, and then people work on it. You know what I mean? It's a very kind of organic process. The, the way pieces happen, and I'm just on the outside trying to figure out if it connects the dots, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and whatever journey the characters are taking. We, so we haven't worked with the dramaturg in a long time. <laughs> so it's, 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 this is a very interesting process for, for us and for the work we do. Um, so, but that, that's, that's the way we built for the last 30 years. I, don't, uh, I, I haven't worked with dramaturgs, because we don't, we don't, I, I, I believe, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm here to break it. That's what I mean. <laughs> No, I believe that, that, that you have to allow the piece to speak by itself mm -hmm. before we start messing with it, you know. So it's quiet, we don't, we're not very hard 
all the story goes this way, this other. You know what I mean? At this point, I guess after we do it, I was thinking about melancholia, if you never saw me, that has taken us 10 years to make it where we want it to be. That came from, you know, it takes a long time for the work to really come up the way we want it. It's never finished in a way. That's a good thing, you know? Yeah. So you can still write your after the piece that is because you, you can publish them, but in a way you have to publish all the rest. And you know what I mean? All, all the little, tiny little images of this thing and how that works is different. Right? You know, and I know the other just here thought this is a great story to see, but in our process we kind of try to think that we're creating all these sort of things that are not in the normal only play right? you know. A lot I think a lot I love I'm gonna steal your metaphor often in the future. I think a lot of what I do as a dramaturg is uh, ask ask good questions and uh, and to to be the proxy for the audience, to be just come into a project hold each time and receive it on its own playing field and then ask genuine questions about my experience with it. Um, what's interesting is to see as we're seeing in this festival a lot of theater that is completely non-traditional and that many people might not even think is theater. Uh, so I'm curious if you could talk about, we're talking about dramaturgy, so for now let's talk about drama. And whether you're conscious of creating drama on stage and what drama means to each of you specifically. What is important for you? <laughs> discussing immigration heavily in this country. And now we said that in our discussion with the company we have to talk about the contribution that Mexicans have done to the United States in the last few years. How do we do that? And this was that. So and we do popular theater we think. You know, our theater is popular, our audience is a popular audience. They they come to the theater popular forms that exist in the theater to create the work. Because we want to have a dialogue with our audience. So it is drama, very clearly, very clearly, you know, there is a conflict, there is character, there is an emotional journey that the characters have to have for our audience to have a relationship to us as, uh, as a theater. And, and uh, uh, especially we have an audience who don't go to the theater. So we have to find a way yeah, it's very clearly, you know, how we always have to have a story. We always have to have a story, and we always have to have conflict, even with the world or by themselves, you know, but it's always have to have that idea of the traditional drama type of theater. We try to find other forms, and usually they come from the popular form. You know, and it's really, we look for those things in order to create a dialogue. To be asked, what, what does drama in different circumstances mean to you create drama? Um, well, I have a question actually. Yeah. Um, what does drama really mean? I mean, in the, the old Greek word, what, what's the literal translation? Do you know? <laughs> does anybody know? I don't. So it's, if, if anybody does, please. It's, it's funny so, that. Oh, we don't have a subject, we can't look it up. Oh. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Action. 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 Thank you. Thank you. 
But she just thought that. So, so drama, <laughs> drama means action. And it's interesting if you think about action. I don't know if I'm going to answer no, your no, question do. straight away. But how, you know, it's interesting that it's action, but at the same time you're sitting on your chair, but you're involved in a, in, in a mind action, right? So your body is not acting at this point. Well, the, the actors are acting, but the, the, the audience is acting in its mind. So I think that drama and good drama is really about a heightened involvement and about um, identification with a heightened state of being. Good drama is, and it, it doesn't matter what kind of, you know, if it's music uh, or uh, if it's theater in its narrowest sense, I think the heightened involvement um, that, you know, gets you to this other place where you are in total, uh, uh, on, on the same level as the character in the story, that makes a good drama. That you imagine, imagine yourself being in this heightened state of existence. And the interesting part that, that you know, catharsis is always about loss or death or grief, or, but also about um, the new mom, I would say, it's also about acceptance, it's grief and acceptance, right? These are the moments that define our life, that's birth and death, for instance, or love and death, like Eros and Thanatos. And I think if you can reenact, or not even reenact, but enact, this feeling on stage, then everybody in the audience gets, you know, in touch with the basic question of life. So I think it's interesting that the drama means action while you're not doing anything except for looking and listening. It is easier, sorry, it is, I think it's easier, it's easier in popular theater to check in with your audience about the way in which a piece is moving mm -hmm. when uh, the conflict of the characters in the story are very clear, when that relationship with the audience is a little bit clearer. How do you do it? How do you check in with your audience to see if this heightened state of being is occurring with them when the piece is much less traditional and when it might move a much smaller portion of your audience, when it is not popular? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I had an interview with Peter Greenaway, he's a film filmmaker. I don't know if you know him. Um, and he said, and you know, it's very experimental, right? And he said, well, you're, whatever you do, 90% has to be known. The 10% is the experiment of what you are telling. So how do you check in? You try to, I don't know, uh, it's different in, in any kind of situation. What has to be done of of, of the, the story you're telling or the piece you're making. I think when we're talking about experimental productions, I think the experiment is just a small portion. I, um, so, for instance, let me give an example, yeah. right? So, Wunderbaum is, a, I think, <laughs> a, a, on the one hand, doing different stuff with forms, but on the other hand, it's really making sure that it pleases its audience in a good way. And um, so it has a, quite a young audience in the Netherlands, but still it's not, I mean, it's, it's theater for one, right? And having a young audience in the Netherlands for theater, that's, that's difficult. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was only us. No, 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 obviously not. Uh, and, and, and I think second of all, um, they work together with a lot of amateur actors and they do this very out of space kind of form sometimes. But they really try to make sure in the way they work and they approach the people that they level with them. So, yeah, it's, it's actually, I'm just yada yada, I'm saying something, but I'm trying to think it out loud what, what, what it is that, that you're asking. But how can you level with the people 
get them into a heightened sense, state of sensation. I think you have to take your audience really seriously and listen to them. Um, I don't know. Actually, I don't. But this is yeah, our yeah. method, you know, to try to, to be... I think that, that, well, this is what I can say about it, that right now we're performing this peace hospital and actually it's still in the making process. And this is just the next phase where the audience is really coming in and is telling us what is working and what's not, right? So, yeah, so we're now in this phase where the audience is actually participating in what the sh show will become. And so eventually push it up to 90%. Uh, become a 90% now. Uh, no, um, let me ref. Uh, oh, yeah. well, perhaps, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's right, that's right. And Tina, how do you level with your audience? What's the conversation you want to have? Well, I mean, it's interesting because uh, I feel like we have much more conversation with our audiences than we used to because of the internet. People write after they see a show. And you end up having a dialogue with them via email. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it was something that never happened in the past. And now people write, you have these conversations, and you almost become friends. <laughs> it's very interesting. And you, you uh, start to hear what their interests are, what their concerns are, what the work you're doing. They, they ask questions. They, they, they pose some interesting questions sometimes. And, uh, so that's been different and interesting, a way of finding out information that they're just offering. We're not even, you know, putting out questionnaires or anything. They're just, and that's the best way for people on their own steam ask the question. Uh, I think also that when you put your work in front of an audience, that's when you get the love like, immediately. Like, you know when it's working, when it's yeah. not. Uh, you just do, and, and a lot of times, you know, we're not watching rehearsal. When Richard comes to rehearsal, we're watching, and, and we try to be as objective as possible. But it's impossible because you're you're so in it, and I, I can understand the distance that you're talking about. Um, it's almost like you need a therapist to come in and go. Now calm down. It's like you need to, that's, you know, it's what, exactly. That's what we do. It's like, yeah. I imagine your therapist quite a bit. Just you know, chill out, calm down, step back. What, mm. what, and so, um, so anyway, trying to, to look at things maybe one track at a time of the information we're putting out. We have the, the, the text, we have the dialogue, we have the lighting, we have the costumes, we have the movement, we have the interaction, we have the, the mise-en-scene, what's happening with the, the actors in between them. All those things, if you take the parts and try to look at them separately, that sometimes can bring a little objectivity as well as far as the leveling goes. But really for me, it's when the audience comes in. And then for us recently, being able to tour to different places and, and bring our shows to various audiences has been very informative to us because you go to different locations within a country, within a county even, and you get different audience base that are giving you different feedback, responding to certain parts of the piece in different ways. So that, that all is It's important. interesting because, yeah. you know, we grew up you being taught that drama is universal. Is it, do you have to adjust your dramaturgy to different cultures and to different settings? Are there different expectations of what the experience should be, of what conversation a piece of art should have with you? Well, in, in the past, I was, I was in working with a group called Mumachans, which uh, was a mind mask dance theater company, and we traveled everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And we did the same show most of the time, but the audiences were always different and vastly different reactions. And we worked very much as, uh, the, the show wasn't happening unless we had an audience. We had to have that feedback for our timing and oftentimes people would walk out of the show saying, oh, I love the music in that show. And there was no music. If there was no sound whatsoever. <laughs> the, the music was the interaction between the performers, the mask, the audience and the, the fantasy and imagination that everybody had, and that if we could create it. And so some audiences, you could feel that, that connection immediately. In others, there was this distance that then all of a sudden would quickly 
come together like this and it would be like, oh, now we have a connection. And it was surprising. Um, you just never knew. And so that was an incredible uh, educational experience, traveling to all these different countries and, and uh, just sensing the different responses to how they take a simple story, because their stories were very simple, and how they responded to simple stories in almost poetic ways. So that, that too was a, a good um, honing of sensing mm -hmm. what, what the audience response is. And, what, and, and, and I do think that it's different, but I do think as well that there is a universal soul amongst us all that responds to certain human interactions. And, and that's what we're trying to find on stage in humorous ways as well. So I think humor, too, is, is a beautiful phrase in Chinese. Um, I don't know the exact translation, but when you you have someone laughing, you reach in to their throat and grab their heart. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, that's how you reach someone's heart, is by getting them to open up and laugh. And so I find that to be a, a universal experience that we all have. That is interesting, because in the previous discussion, there was someone in the front who was who asked Lemmy about humor, and I, I don't know if she's here. Uh, the subtext was why there wasn't any humor in the piece, is what I took from it. Uh, meaning, and I think she was implying that it, it, it certainly helps bring you into any experience, no matter how shocking or visceral it is. Uh, and you're saying that it's, it's crucial to your process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it crosses, humor can cross both your and Jose Luis, you said that your primary mission is really to write and create theater for a one community. To what extent do you broaden that and tighten that? Does it, does it specific become universal yeah. in your case? Mm -hmm. I, I think as we have a different idea, it's like this. You open the window of the bedroom and let people come in and see what's going on. In our case. You, you know what I mean? So that becomes a source. We haven't toured much. We took one play around the country, and, and it's been extraordinary stretch because we think we're so LA based. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this, come on, we're taking this like, this is where I'm going to get this play at all. You know, because it's totally a whole, you know, our own intellectual exercise and our own idea, but we understand our audience in Los Angeles, and the response was amazing. Total, I mean, even we were surprised how much they got. What we did. And then we took melancholia to, to the theater professor. It was like amazing. People were like, and it was that's very specific, very specific about, you know, what what we want to talk about in the tour community and about, the, you know, it's always what's happening. But when the other audience had come in, it's, it's been very amazing, amazing. It's interesting, I just did Craig in Norway. Which was, you know, I don't, and my concern is I don't know these things. And you know, I'm working with the company and I'm trying to put them through the same process. And you know, Mexican images are coming in and I have to put them in there. You know, just because of who I am in the process. And then I thought, oh my God, you know, I was so nervous about the alien scene up here again in Norway. They know every line yeah. and every monologue because they study like crazy. And it was so fantastic because they connected to these ideas that they, you know, but because it's a certain purity that happens when you when you're doing the work and trying to find the, 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 what I think is a true image of that woman, they that sort of mean. I'm sure they didn't even get this, but you know, Solve at the end of the play, I read it as the Virgin Mary, you know, and and they totally connected to it. They were like, I mean, they said me it was about, you know, how he had created this incredible Virgin Mother, everything on his mind, and it was like, and that just came out of what I think, and not necessarily it was not an idea that I had I should do this. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting how when, when you go from that place, it's all I know. You know what I mean? I, I'm not going to be, to do a blonde sobe, you know what I mean, coming from the I can't, I don't even know what that means in my brain. 
So it's interesting how when you take it out, it becomes much more universal mm -hmm. than what you think. Mm -hmm. When you work that particular. And it's because we all, it's the only time we have two. And our work has been in this theater for 30 years. So it's, we know what our things and we know how we can push them a little bit, push them to learn more about the theater, you know, you know accept more. And to be as you collaborated, wonder about collaborated with LA Poverty Park. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and what was that experience like of working with a company that might have its own aesthetic, its own notion of what dramaturgy is, and its own audience? Well, it's interesting. Uh, um, it's interesting because the piece itself is about, you know, it's about healthcare, but it's about two different systems of healthcare, or that was the starting point. And, uh, and then, of course, also the differences between the Netherlands and the US. And uh, I mean, that, that, that artistic research became also a research of methods, really. And um, we experienced that sometimes we have an assumption as Dutch people that I'm sorry, are theatrical methods or med medical hospitals? No, no, sorry. Theatrical yeah. methods, really the making of uh, the piece itself. It was really, a, a, it was really a, a, quite an adventure to, to, to find, and we're still doing this actually, to find a method that uh, includes taste, aesthetics, uh, worldviews, it's funny because we Dutch think that we have become Americans in the past 65 years, but you know, that's just, that's just only the facade, right? We only got the facade of what America is like. And if, if you go to America, you're just so surprised by the sheer, you know, difference that, that makes up this, this country, right? And not just the one facade you get on TV. So uh, I think that sometimes we Dutch people assume that we understand Americans and the other way around, possibly too. So we really had to find uh, a method to come together and talk about this uh, subject. And we still do, and it's an adventure. Yeah. It, it's also the first collaboration, right? So you're getting to know each other. I mean, it's like a marriage but uh, it, it, you, but you didn't have you know this how do you say courtship <laughs> well but it's not exactly true because we knew John Malpete and we, and, and Wunderbaum has been uh, in LA before and met people in Skid Row but still that was John Malpete uh, as an actor and now we're working with what Elliot we did. and it's an adventure but it's also really interesting because they have a different ways of looking uh, towards involving actors, uh, telling stories, different ideas about how plays can become political. And uh, that's a really worthwhile experience. It's not always easy, but it's, uh, it's really worthwhile. So in a way, the topic of uh, the piece, you know, the Netherlands in America has become the method of work. The method itself is becoming Yeah, it, to an extent. I don't know if you will see the play, perhaps you will also see that every scene has a totally different approach or a different try at taking the subject. So the whole play goes like, ooh, like this. It's a workshop. It's a <laughs> workshop, <laughs> yes. No, no, I think it's a workshop, yeah. So your, your insight is workshop, and hopefully you also get the story and get involved. I want to see, are, are there any questions from you guys or our panelists about the way they make art or conceive of drama? Yes? I think that's actually what you just said. What is your inspiration? What inspires you to create? Do you know so what inspires? I think it's all. Yeah. all inspires to create. It's kind of like um, 
of breathing. <laughs> you know, everything around and uh, me inspires me in some way to want to express it artistically and, react, and through the idea of theater and movement and dance is how I express myself. Since I'm not a writer or a composer, I compose with people and images and I'm always reading stories, seeing things that are happening in the world, also going back into historical plays that I find interesting, wanting to find how to bring that into the modern day. Those things sort of, they're, they're very inspiring to me. It's an interesting question. Um, um, I have to, I'm having this discussion with my Wunderbaum colleagues about whether I'm an artist or not. <laughs> and I would say I'm not, and I'm really saying that because I want to have this distance, right? And it's not playing my role down, it's not because I'm not vain or whatever. But um, I think that the truth of my inspiration is getting inspired by the other people's inspiration. I don't like to come up, up with an idea myself, I like to be inspired by an idea an idea and hopefully can make a contribution to it. So I see myself as a contributing factor and not the other way around. And, and for me that's crucial to what I do. And it's also crucial to how I want to be in life actually. It's a really life uh, approach to me. So, you know, I, my spark is, yeah, when I see somebody else getting really furious or enthusiastic about it. And, that's okay, great. Let's go for it. How shall we do? Right. And 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 that places me in a in a great situation because I can work with opera artists or musicians or great people in skip row or whatever. I mean, that doesn't really matter. What what does matter is if people are inspired. So I'm a second hand man, right? And I have second hand inspiration. I don't know. Yes. Oh my God. And I, for us, or for me, but I, I talk for us because of the because it's always in the company, it's, they're usually things that happen in the country that I want to discuss in the audience. You know, that there is, America is such a conflicted country for us. So when those questions come up or something happens, that inspire us or inspire me to say, this is an important question to be discussed that I don't have the answer. And I don't even know if I would have the answer, but at least we can dig into it. I wonder if you can talk about it, because you, uh, you certainly use technology. To what extent technology has expanded your notion of what theater is, whether it might have limited it. We usually think this tech often we think technology is distracting. There's so many people, it's so easy for people to be entertained uh, and not go to the theater. But uh, technology, as you said in the, your example, how it brings you closer to your audience can actually create many more points of connection and actually expand. But I've also seen, for instance, video use badly as used literally in anti theatrical mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about uh, how technology has expanded your view of yeah, what's theatrical. Yeah, I mean, I think it, what's happening in the world right now with uh, mixed media on stage is, is quite amazing. And uh, some groups use it to a beautiful effect. As you said, others are making a bad name for video. But uh, you know, I think uh, I think uh, our company, Theater Movement Bazaar, has used uh, multimedia in the past, and and it's it really you go down this technology route, and it is all consuming, and it, it really does kind of uh, direct which way the show is going to head because you have to do that kind of work so far in advance. And, you know, unless you have a really, really long, you know, period in which to go back and forth and workshop it again and again and again. Um, 
So in a, in a sense, it was a restraint, but then the restraint can be liberating as well. And uh, we've chosen in the past few shows to go technology free so that we could get back to working with just what's at hand, the simplest needs, what the simplest uh, things. We have the actor, we have the spectator, and maybe uh, a couple chairs and tables. So let's see what we can do with that. Um, just to sort of get back to the basics mm -hmm. and see how we can reinvigorate those basics and get those to be the best they can be before we add all the bells and whistles of technology. And we probably, not to say that we wouldn't do pieces with technology again, we probably would. Um, but anyway, this is a, a period that we're kind of refreshing ourselves and rethinking. Getting back to basics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we use technology. Uh, no, it's not a real, there's no real agenda throughout, you know, different Performances. I think it's there. You can use it if it works. Great. If you if it doesn't work, you don't use it. In the hospital piece, uh, we use a camera. That's the technology, right? And we use microphones. And uh, we we kept the camera and the and the and the picture and the picture the, the screen in because it actually uh, enabled us to get, you know, this really up close um, uh, close shots and, um, and well, why have we left it in? I think it's, it's uh, well, the piece in a way is about sometimes about, you know, the distance that has come up with this whole healthcare care is actually about, you know, close somebody taking care of someone else. Uh, uh, and, uh, but there's a lot, actually when you tell the healthcare history of the states or the Netherlands, you see there's only distancing, right? Corporatism take coming in and actually trying to, to say, well, if you need care, you have to pay me. You know, I mean, that's a very, of course, very simple remark, but there's a lot of distancing in the whole healthcare system so we wanted to have, you know, also these very up close images. So why do we use it? It's there. Does it work? Uh, I, what we think it, it, it adds something to the performance. But it's different every time. So we don't have a real agenda. Don't know if that answers your question. Well, we <coughs> we use it sometimes in, in hope. Yeah. Having that. And that one actually we did a, a workshop. We, we're very interested in using technology because it happens to be the television time. The television is very powerful for the first time that play. But it was interesting because we did a, a, a workshop. I wanted to have rooms where cameras were inside the room. So when the scene was going out to the outside, the actors will be, the characters will be inside the rooms and we'll still be alive to see them. And with the, with the uh, like the whole experiment, the interesting point, we showed it to an audience, and it was just like to see, but when they were arguments inside the room and the characters just fell out on the outside, the audience died. The screen was more real than when they saw the actors. It was really dangerous for us to do that. Do you know what I mean? Because suddenly people why is it just because of that intimacy here up close? For some people? reason, I have no idea, but the audience reacted like, I love the scene on the screen, but when the actors came out, I stopped to love it. And I was, I freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, I say, Shh, you know what I mean? What's happening, we're so used to thinking that the image on the screen is more real now than real life. But just because we have so much of it. That. So, we, and we didn't have enough time to really work it in when that did not happen. But, but, it, but because it was only to give us the idea that we can see the fear of the joy of the happiness of the character. It still has to, has to fit the, the, the journey of the play. I didn't want to use that just as a, 
oh, I think I think no one is a good thing to have, you know? So we pull it out. To the point that some of the ones that we used, it was just shadows, and that were better. You know what I mean? So we used it at the end, because it's part of the story that television is a very, it's the first time we see mm -hmm. television in its prime. You know? So it has, for, for us, it has to serve the purpose of the play and the idea of what we want with the audience. I think it's very important to me. I, I'm a professor at UCLA. I work with directors, I teach directors, and they get great ideas. And with the young and coming, and we give them an adaptation of the Odyssey, for example, where the play begins on the internet. Mm -hmm. And all the first dialogue is all in the internet. And when they come in, they sit with a computer and make the dialogue. And they're out there. It's not what we do. I think younger directors are going to work it much more because they're more savvy on the technology. They have grown up with it. They're 21 year olds who had a computer when they were two year olds. You know what I mean? So, that's, I think it's going to be very important in the theater, but it's a mindset. Do you worry, uh, do you think a lot about a younger, how to approach a younger generation that we all assume expects different things from their entertainment? Do you think they expect a different experience from their entertainment and from their art? And if so, if you, is that something that you bring There's all this buzz about the internet generation and, and stuff. Do you think their needs and wants are going to change what we present on our stages? It's different for, for our audience is from 20 to 45. You know, it's different to me. It's, it's, as a community, they don't have as much access. Yes, for example. So we're not concerned about that, you know. To have the, we have the best audience in the world, the 20 year olds, you know, who come to the theater and sit down and they love to see it. And the, you know, these simple stories, ways, which I think that's where we are. And that's why I say everybody's in a, in a different time if you have an end, you know, an end to what you need to do. It's a different. Could you rephrase your question? <laughs> <laughs> Does it make sense what I'm asking at all? I wonder if somebody else can rephrase it. Um, I think there's a sense that we're always told that younger generations have shorter attention spans, that they're uh, a bit, they're a, a that they're uh, they like quick images, uh, that they have a different expectation of what will engage them emotionally. I have no idea if that's true. Or if experienced it. Um, yeah, yeah, what I try to do as much as possible is not make a separation between them or me or Adam. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's the first step, right? Um, I think, sure, I mean, times change and then attention spans change also, needs change. Um, I don't know. I hope I won't ask myself this question for a long time because when I do, then I think I'm starting to get old. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I, I, I didn't need to say that. No, I, I mean, well, don't talk about being old, okay? <laughs> uh, it's, very, it's very. I think you just have to be in touch with whatever you are doing and what feels right for you. And audiences come or not, I think that it's as simple as that. Because you try to cater for something you don't really feel, or you don't really understand, then it won't work uh, either. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I teach young <laughs> yeah, they're, you know, age 17 up to into their 30s, which I still consider young. And, uh, and, they, and I 
I've seen them change over the years that I've been teaching. And, but there are some things that you know don't change. There are constants. Um, you know what moves people, what touches them, what makes them laugh. Um, even though people may put on a facade of, of being modern and hip and all this other stuff underneath, everyone you know they still have the same emotions and feelings. And I don't think. It, I mean, technology may have made things faster and everything, but we understand and, and we feel, I think it, I think, I'm not a scientist or anything, or an expert on this, but I, I think that we feel and understand at the same rate in a lot of ways, that there's certain, uh, yeah, and that if you are trying to understand people and stay in contact with them is important when, when you work in the theater, and no matter what age the people are, and so that, all of humanity is an interest to you. And, and as you're saying, it's good not to have a separation. Um, and and I, I feel very fortunate to work with young people so closely on a regular basis. Uh, sometimes I feel I may be out of touch with people my age. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyway, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting that young people see stuff that they don't know. I mean, if they see something they already do know, right? Mm -hmm. now, I mean, if it's compelling, it's compelling, right? But if you see something that they already do know and it isn't that compelling, then I mean, so it's interesting also that a theater can be a, a place where where you know, gaps between generations are being bridged or something. I don't know. I think it's yeah, it has to be ageless, right? Yeah, I, mean, I had this conversation with Antonio in Europe about because I think I mean. I make theater for people. I don't make theater for theater people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think because we have these conversations in another way. And when I do the work, we always say, you know, I, I really want to make theater for regular people because the theater people are really a small crowd. <laughs> and, and, you know, you're doing a, a cast of 100 people and you want 1,000 people to come. You know what I mean? Who may not have the same dialogue that we can have about the art form. You know, and so a lot of times this conversation about age and about technology is a theater conversation more than a dialogue at, at large with, the, with, with people. You know, so I think theater has different purposes. I mean, we all, our artists are in different spaces and time and a different part of So, I think it didn't understand the question yet, but it's just because I'm Dutch. And no, no, <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think I asked the question in a very Vietnamese way. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was a Vietnamese yeah. question. Uh, no, the way I've heard it was, I, it's, it's some, I'll tell you, I've, most of my career has been spent dramaturging plays. <coughs> Board, script, director, cast. And you ask questions that have to do with clarity, or if there's something's ambiguous, did you, the playwright, intend it to be ambiguous, right? Uh, in recent years, I've had the luck to work with companies. Uh, uh, I just got back from Berlin where I worked with Gob Squad, a piece that we co-commissioned. Um, and I worked on a piece called The Elephant Room that we produced at the Kirk Douglas Theater years ago. And that is, uh, I, I have had to flex a very different kind of muscle 
in that uh, my openness to the experience of the piece, which may not be narrative, uh, is different. And I have, I, it's, it's gonna sound, I, it, it sounds so lame, but I have to open up my heart a little bit more. Uh, and really, there's a level of trust. Like, for instance, Gob Squad is premiering in 10 days. And we had a note session in Berlin this past Friday, where basically we're talking and I was giving them my experience of it. And they said, uh, and they're basically gonna redo half of it in 10 days. And if it were a play with a script, you would be freaking out. But they can do it because they are a unit. They listen to each other. They're, they're uh, kind of an organism. Yeah. Um, and so my, my consigliere uh, uh, kind of thing that I do, which is what I think I am. Uh, is, uh, you should wear a ring and make a is, uh, is, is different. There's a greater level of trust. It is a much scarier journey. Uh, you, uh, and you also, I'm also very much aware that it is not, that these are pieces that will not appeal to everyone, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That not every audience member will go on the journey. But I have to represent, in workshop, I have to represent the audience member who is willing to go on the journey and help try to track it. But it is, it's a different, it's been a different muscle for me. Yeah. And I have to say that one muscle that I think it's making me a better dramaturg with playwrights as well. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question anyway? Yeah, I, I just said, it's, it's that I, I'm very interested in that nuance of how do you, in a room as a dramaturg, help the artist? Uh, how do you ask, what, how, how do you find the right question to help them, help them with that next step? To have that spark of inspiration. Right, right. right. because you can, with a more traditional piece, you could say, okay, if you want the audience to understand this in this moment, yeah. I question whether or not they do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about clarity, it's about, but when the piece, when that moment that you are creating you purposely mean it to mean different things to many different people. Mm -hmm. Do you mean yeah. what, what is what can you do to help an artist yeah. fully realize what it is they're trying, what they're doing in that moment? <laughs> so to me, I, I, I think everybody's trying to aim the same thing in different versions of it, on different ways, even the pieces of. Uh, you know, it, it's a different emotional and intellectual journey that they want us to have, but still trying to end the same thing, honestly. Now, I haven't seen the piece that he was talking about, which now I'm gonna go see. But, you know, I, I, I see other pieces. I think they're trying to end the same thing. It's more difficult, of course, because you're talking about a word that is created from inside and it's, you know it takes more time but I, I believe me I think they want to have the same relationship to the audience that we do in a higher level of expression maybe. and they want to request us a, a, a bigger emotional investment and that's why work is more difficult because it may be that it doesn't fit you know what I mean but I think they're trying to end the same thing very I mean, performance art came out of the rejection of the laws of theater. We are going to reject all the laws of theater. We're not even going to perform it in the theaters. I mean, that was the idea when it started, you know. And, and it was, you know, it was a game of the mind. If you remember the early performance arts, I mean, it is what it was. That when I challenge you of all the laws of theater, and even we went for it or not, you know, and I think what we see in this, it's, you know, performance artists transforming into performances for an audience. You know, so it's like, this is an accumulation of that, what we see in there more now. You know, 
And you learn a new, each team has a new language. Yeah, you would probably have a short, you were saying a shorthand if you're a collaborator, where you know you've got your own vocabulary. And as the conciliary is new to pro, you have to learn a new language, the way they talk about their aims and their techniques in a way that is new to someone who has really worked with players. I'd like to answer that question. Um, I've also worked a lot, and I'm still working with regular playwrights. Uh, and in, in, in this case... No such thing as a No, that's right. You're called playwright. A very odd playwright. Uh, uh, but, you know, normally uh, this process will take us uh, more than one year to really write a play itself with different, you know, versions and tapes and it means that you have to invest uh, a lot of energy into to trying to find out what it perhaps will look like in one year and a half, uh, you know, starting from now. So you're working differently, and the steps that you have to take have to be taken, you know, a long time in advance. But with Wunderbaum, it's very different. They don't have uh, the script already made. The script is made during the production process. And actually, uh, the last week we changed it all. We changed the whole beginning. So I think what, what my, my, my job as a dramaturg is for a versatile group <coughs> as Wunderbaum, that is also really like a band. You can understand it as a band. They have no directors, so they are a collective. But they've been working together for 10 years, and they really know their strengths and how they work. They can say three words, and then they will do it the next day, and it's a huge difference. And I think uh, the difference with making a, or helping make a, a, a normal play is that right now the time is so condensed, and that you have to really think really fast and work really hard in very, very long days, and, and that you really have to refrain yourself from seeing stuff all the time, so hold your horses, <laughs> the mind is going crazy and then say, okay, yeah, everybody said it, okay. Now is the time and, you know, if the time is right, then perhaps, but so, so, you just have to think really fast. Much faster than with a regular piece because it's so extremely versatile. And it's just 24 hours in a day. Master. <laughs> I was wondering um, what, why you think that um, theater, you mentioned opera as well, sort of performance art has, um, has, has, has developed this position of dramaturg where other art forms don't have it. Um, so I think like a film, for instance, and, and you look at like Fellini's Eight and a Half, and there's a character who's kind of a parody of a dramaturg always had decided he was a critic and he was just spouting out all these intellectual things and challenging you know Guido to make the right movie and it was interesting that dialogue but it's interesting to me that, that theater you know it has this, this position that's come up where it's like you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna help the director or the company make this this piece and just kind of on what was wondering about that. Uh, so the dramaturg the first dramaturg was uh, Lessing uh, in the, uh, at the well, second half of the 18th century in Germany. And what happened was that uh, German theater groups started to organize and get their own uh, playhouses. And they had a, a, a repertory system. So it meant that they had to produce, well, they had to finance those buildings all of a sudden. And, you know, they, they were the, the, the middle class that came to the fore, and they had to make their own money, so they had to have Every night they had to have a different show. But you know, you cannot have a different show if you're just a, with a group of 20 people making theater, right? So you, you need to have someone who's actually uh, uh, finding other people's plays, that plays that you didn't write yourself. I mean, that are, you know, from England or whatever, named by this guy named Shakespeare who nobody knows. And then you think, well, it has to be translated. And then, so this lesson, person was actually someone who was trying to find good plays 
translate them and present it to the audience. So what this means is that the dramaturg came uh, when the theater was really at its height, when the theater was very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, the word, I mean, the tasks were split up because the work was, the, 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 the load of work, the yeah. workload was getting bigger and bigger. So all of a sudden you had a director, actors, uh, somebody who was, uh, you know, a directing assistant. I mean, I mean also the director was a, was a position that, that started up in, in, in this 18th century, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, Moyer was a director, but he didn't call himself a director or a writer. Or, I mean, he was the leader of the group. He made it happen. Right? So this is how it started. And I think that the Dutch system, for instance, the theater system was just a copy of this German system. So it was there, the, the dramaturg. And I think the dramaturg is a very luxurious position. You don't need it, really. But if you can afford it and you like it, why not? <laughs> So it's just a very quirky, you know, history yeah. scene. <laughs> but I mean, the process is there in every one of the yeah. yeah, it's interesting. It was evident to me yesterday when we were there, uh, one of the panels, where I think uh, it was Claudia who was reacting. He was somewhat perplexed by this word dramaturgy. And I'm just wondering how many of the other companies, if we were to put them on this ask them about dramaturgy, that they would say, well, it's really not a luxury that we have or that we want. You know, it's just kind of, we know how to work as a company. We have a process, and this is how we create the work. We don't have someone from the outside can come in and say, well, if you want to get to this point, we really want to clarify it here. Um, so, the theater movement, sorry, does not have a staff. Dramaturgs were doing in the American theater. You know, 
they would come and tell you, this is what that's important, this is what you have to do. And, and it was like, oh. then all, suddenly, all the place began to look the same. <laughs> if you go back to the 1980s, you know, most of the playwrights ended up writing plays that are very similar in style and in form. It, it was like, oh my God, you know, I, I have this stuff from a church school because it's, you know what I mean? And yeah, we need people, we have collaborators. We all, you know, if we can allow an actor to say, let's do this, of course we can allow somebody with some sort of intelligence and research and knowledge to be part of the process of creation, but not necessarily to be a sort of doctor. You, you know what I mean? It, which he gets very much from Hollywood. I think this is what happened, because in Europe, you know, we got dramaturgs all the time. I mean, every time I work in Europe, I have two or three, you know what I mean? That gave you all the research. These are the, because they're mostly, you know, they do work that is already been done. You don't do new plays, in my case. So, you know, you have all these people who give you this amazing research, who tell you about the history, you know, and they do help a lot how to reconstruct your idea and clarify it for you, especially if you work in a different language, you know. So they're very, very helpful in, 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 in when you work with. I think that the reaction to the American dramaturg, especially in the 80s, it was because it was a whole movement to be much more, like they knew more than the writer itself in many ways, you know. And that became kind of all the playwrights and everybody were like, oh my God, I want, you know. But I, that's, that's, that's really what had happened in the dramaturgical process in the American theater. In the American theater, because the only ones who got it, as the original theaters, were the only ones who could afford it, in a way. I think it's very important to talk about the dangers of dramaturgy. Really. <laughs> I mean, there's also a place I am ruined. <laughs> I'm actually really serious about it. You know, it's, it, you know the danger is that you get this mon monumentalization that there's someone who's already, you know, chewing out, you know, all the answers, you know, and getting all the questions out. An expert, yeah. mm -hmm. and an expert who knows it all, you know. But, um, that's really my nightmare. You know, if I become that, I'm hope. There's a great book by a very better person called Fred McKay how dramaturgy ruined uh, theater. Oh, I, it's on my list. Because <laughs> yeah. how many books are written about dramaturgy? It's very <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Actually, he's not there. He's, it's really, he's a wonderful director uh, who has a very small theater company. could never afford a dramaturgy. But, but I'd like to come up, but I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'd just like to go and I, I try to make it short. Um, so I, I, I started working with Wunderbaum uh, nine months ago. Or what is it? Yeah, in general. And they, they have existed for 10 years already. I mean, they make beautiful pieces without, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> right? So, what the hell am I doing? But they, they I mean, they asked for a dramaturg. And the interesting part is, is actually that the role of what a dramaturg can be is changing. And, it, the, the, and, and, and it's really about what can I put on the table what's not already there. Because if I go there, I, did, I, I can remember the first conversation I had with Walter Bart, one of the actors and writers and uh, directors, I mean, they do it all themselves. I said, hey, so you actually had a job advertisement for a dramaturg? I mean, that's really rare to do it for something. I'm, I'm actually really interested. I see, I've seen your work, you know, for years now. And then he got scared because I was this dramaturg from this playhouse in, in, in Rotterdam. And the first thing he said was, well, actually, it's just a word because we already, I mean, we are our, our own dramaturgs, right? And then uh, I, okay, with that in mind, but also thinking about it, I still decided to write a letter and we had a very long job. The, 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 it took us about five months of them, uh, about five months to find the right person that could fit this description. And the thing that I'm right, doing right now, sorry, it's a long story, but I'll have to tell it, but in a short way. They started a, 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 a 
very big project in January, which is called the New Forest. And basically, what the idea is is trying to uh, to create a new society. It's very utopian, if you will, but it also plays with the idea of utopia. But the, so this project, the New Forest, this new society, uh, started in January and will go down uh, in December 2016. During that time, performances will be made about various topics. This one is healthcare, we did one about power, so we had a, a Chinese eight-year-old girl install this new society in, in May, uh, in, in, in one of them, and we go on and on with all these topics. These are, these are the performances, right, that I'm also involved. But we want to do more with this society. So, for instance, we have seminars where we have a bay watcher and uh, a journalist and uh, very different people talking about their new ways of bay watching and journalism. And the interesting part is that it's, this also makes up this whole new forest project. What I want to say is that um, what, uh, what I like about it that I try to find a niche of presenting stuff that can help this idea make bigger than only just the performances itself. So, and that's much more interesting, of course, than a dramaturg who knows it all, who has read it all. I mean, uh, I like the way the research is going, you know, beyond the performances itself, as, as real production. I have, I'm afraid we've, uh, we've reached past our time, so we're, we're going to have lunch, so please come up to us and speak with we'll us. We'll have a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I will leave you with yeah. Thank you guys, and thank you for your time.